I love the John Murray Thomas Potter story. We refer to it as the one and only miracle in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, stuck on the sandbar for three days until he could preach. But like all good miracle stories as they appear in the Bible, the real miracle is far more human and achievable by all of us. And in this case, Thomas Potter is the miracle worker in that he recognizes in John Murray the person he has been waiting for, this, this down and out, bedraggled, completely empty, soul-crushed man is the person that Thomas Potter looks to after he builds his chapel. If he builds it, the preacher will come and says, you, and doesn't stop saying you until John sees in himself what Thomas has been seeing the whole time, an ability to see in the moment what is needed to see the answer to a prayer that you were not expecting. Imagine if Thomas Potter had been way more of a control freak in this situation. Imagine if he hadn't stopped at, at just building the chapel. Imagine if he thought, all right, I know what the chapel looks like, and I know exactly what the preacher who is coming to me is going to look like, and what words he is going to say to me. I'm just going to build a little sculpture here in the pulpit so that when that person arrives, I will know this guy is a match. And you sit there waiting for the answer, completely sketched out for himself. John Murray would never have preached the first Universalist sermon in America. We might not be where we are here today because Thomas was so locked in his idea of who it was that was coming to preach that we missed the opportunity completely. Thankfully, thankfully, Thomas was more open and far more wise than that. A model to be looked to. Because here in America, at least, kind of our group personality is kind of the control freak. We want to control our future and our present. We want to know what's going to happen next and that we can just follow the next step after the next step after the next step as it is prescribed until we get to the moment that we knew we were going to get to in the first place. We love our spreadsheets. We love our to-do lists. We love our blueprints. We do not like when our episodic television obsessions do not go the way we determined they should go. We want to be in control. And control is fine in, in some cases. A blueprint is necessary in some cases. You're building a church building, you want a blueprint. You do not want to improvise a structure like this. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. But a church that exists inside the building, a faith community that gathers together with some expectations and some presumptions about what the world is going to be needs to be a little looser, needs to operate with a rough sketch of things because the community that gathers here is different every time, whether we like it or not. We have no control over the makeup and the heart of the community we are existing in. Even if we are seeing the same faces here week after week after week, it is never the same community twice because we are coming here with different experiences and worries throughout the week, with different emotional needs from week to week. And then when a new face arrives, it completely changes the zeitgeist of who we are in the process. There is a whole new set of assumptions and expectations and emotions and experiences that need to be brought into the group. We are never the same group twice. And that can be the source of some anxiety for us because 
We need to be in control of everything. We need to know what the outcome is going to be. And this new person coming in, are they just going to throw it all off kilter? Are we going to have to have another community meeting to figure out what the future looks like again because now we've got a completely different person in there? Or do we adjust? Anxiety has been defined in pop culture as the persistent living in the future and trying to have control over it. But if we are living in that future, if we are living in a state of anxiety about the state of our community because of its constant malleability, we miss the moments right in front of us. We miss life happening in front of us. Our expectations should be for the moment as it is, as Elizabeth Tarbox writes to us in her poem. And as a community of seekers, a community that seeks the truth, we are not truly seeking if we think we already know what the end answer is. We're just trying to shoehorn ourselves into a predetermined box, and who knows what we are missing in the process by trying to wedge everybody into something we have predefined. We are not living into our principles at that point. The irony of being a faithful person, of being a people of expectations, of living into faithfulness, is that in order to live into our expectations and our principles, we have to be ready and willing to embrace the unexpected. We have to be ready for the answer we didn't think we were getting, and we didn't know that we needed. How do we do that as a community, though? How do we embrace expectation? How do we grow comfortable in that embracing of the unexpected when we are control freaks? How do we build something new out of so many people with so many varied experiences? The answer is theater games. <laughs> the game we played earlier in the service comes to us from Viola Spolin. Viola Spolin, for anyone with a theater background, is known as the inventor of theater games or improv games that get used for warm-ups and training in theater programs across the country and around the world. But before Viola Spolin was a theater aficionado, she was a social worker working at Hull House in Chicago, a settlement tenement built in the late part of the 19th century, existing through the early part of the 20th century, where immigrant populations from varied countries around the world were coming to settle in Chicago and build their new life together. A made-up community of people who did not speak the same language, have the same cultural experiences, and somehow were building a new community together. And Viola's job was trying to figure out how to get the children of these communities who did not speak the same languages to connect to one another in this Hull House community, how to create something new out of all the disparate places they had come together. How could she make a bridge across such a seeming divide? And she did it by finding new and inventive ways of getting the kids to tell their stories to one another and find their commonalities in their stories. And so these games started to grow. This spacewalk game is one of them. And I love it so much because you don't need language in order to play it and have something be built. It all just comes out of shape, and we can start to build some commonalities around shapes. And sometimes we can surprise ourselves in the process. Let me ask, for those of you who built that special something, that object of meaning as you were working space, were you surprised by what you ended up with? 
Was it not something, did you go in with a plan or did it kind of come out of nowhere? And let me ask my three who played together, once we start connecting, was there a plan? Did you know what you were shaping together when you started? Did, did, did you know what you shaped together by the time you finished? The, okay, I mean, I, I, think I, saw, I think I saw a book coming off a shelf at one point, maybe, but also some drawers being open to, so we had some kind of a hutch or more kind of thing happening, cabinet, yeah. But none of you came up onto the chance of here thinking cabinet when you started. It kind of grew out of the middle between all of you. I love this exercise so much, and it has become a metaphor to me for what my work as a minister is about and what we gather together in a religious community to do, which is to find the thing in the middle that we didn't know was there when we bring all our stuff together. That's what we're getting together to do as a community is create something entirely new that no single one of us had a plan for in the beginning. All we have are our shared expectations and values as a community, and somewhere in the middle of that, we build this new thing. Which brings me to our expectations, our covenants spoken and unspoken. I said at our water communion, part of our work as a people of expectations is that we must come at them with persistence. But on top of persistence, we have to come back to our expectations with a sense of openness. Openness to the unexpected, the thing that we didn't know was there until we started blending ourselves together. Because we say these words weekly, right? How about now? There we go. Okay. Unexpected. <laughs> but if we were to do a four-hour worship service this morning and I was in to interview each one of you individually about what these words mean, what it means to have love as a doctrine, what it means to have service as a prayer, what it means to affirm inherent worth and dignity of all people, I would have 80 different answers. And then where are we? Confusion. Somehow, in the process of living into these expectations, we have to be open to a completely new answer. We have to be ready to let go of our assumptions about what our affirmations and our covenants mean and be ready to be surprised by how others are living into them around us as we are living into it as we understand it. And, and this is the hard, scary part, we have to be willing to be changed by what we experience. We have to be willing to be changed. Because the other miracle in the Murray Potter story is John Murray himself. Murray thought he was running away from everything. He vowed he would never preach again. He prayed he would never have to. But sometimes the unexpected answer to our prayers is no. Sometimes somebody sees something in us or gives something to us of themselves that so profoundly tears us down and puts us back together in ways we were not expecting. We have no choice but to just go with it. And that's John Murray's story. In the process of running away from his life, he ran to something completely new, something he was absolutely not expecting. And instead of 
falling apart at the offer to change and do something new. He grabbed onto it and lived into a completely new life for himself and for all of us eventually because here we are today because of John Murray's willingness to be changed by what he received from others. To be a people of expectation is to be a people willing to let go of all expectation. To be willing to accept an answer that surprises us. To be willing to grow into a change that we were not expecting because of the gifts we are given. Let's pray. Eternal and beloved, gracious source of all life and all love, we come together this morning grateful for this time out of time which we have set apart so that we might become more fully present to ourselves, to each other, to that which we name as holy. May our joys be celebrated together, our wounds be healed together, our hearts be open together. Gracious Spirit, give us a sense of community open, open to possibility, open to surprise, open to a willingness to be changed by what we experience in our interactions with one another. Help us to let go of our rigidness and our need for control. Help us to live into the flow of the space around us and feel the ways we are connected to one another. Help us to become who we must because of who we are rather than who we expect to be because of our close-mindedness. Spirit of community in which we share and find strength and common purpose Turn our minds and hearts this day toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concern all who need our love and our support, those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or in spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. Into the silence, let us speak the names of those we must remember this week.